Let me begin with a story um, that came to me on the bridge on the way over. When I went to Bethel in 1974, I was uh, 28 years old, and I had just finished graduate school and um, was a teacher of Bible and Greek and loved it, loved all six years of it, and wanted to write and began to write and uh, got my dissertation published. That felt real good and got a couple of articles accepted. And, and there came a time, about a year or two into that passion, that I began to really worry about pride. Why am I doing this? Why, why, why do I want to publish? Why do I want to write so bad? Um, is it all just to see my name on a book or in a journal article? And um, I was so exercised about it because the Lord hates pride. Now, you understand that pride is, is a complex thing. It's uh, Pride in the form of the weak is... Um, usually in terms of cravings for what they don't have, craving for attention. And pride in the strong is in the form of boasting for what they do have and what they've done. So don't think that you're free from pride if you're a weak nobody who doesn't have anything to brag about. You're just as victimized by pride as a weak nobody as a big somebody. They're just different forms of what the ego longs for. Either you have something to brag about and get the strokes that way, or you don't have something to brag about, but you crave it like crazy, and you sometimes you become a second-hander, and you begin to adapt your personality to get people to like what you do, and you can become a real lowly servant or whatever. So I, I know the Lord hates that. It's all over the Bible. Almost every I'm reading the prophets right now, the minor prophets. I read Obadiah this morning. I'm behind, and I just circled pride on page one and drew the lines to all the other sins on, in Obadiah. So I came to a point where I said, okay, I think I should just stop. Just moratorium, no writing. So I tried that. And here's what I learned. Okay, now I'm just a teacher, right? Just a, just a college teacher, just teaching students. And guess what? The dean wants student, uh, what do they call them at the end of the class? Evaluation forms. Do I want good ones or bad ones? I want good ones. I want good ones really bad. And I realized, so now what have I, what have I accomplished? I've shifted the battle. That's all. I haven't solved anything. I haven't done anything at all. I've just shifted the battle off of writing onto teaching. And now I've got the same issues in my heart. And then you, you read enough in history and you realize the... Uh, Movement um, of, what are they called? When they go out in the desert, not monks, ascetic, ascetic guys that disappear and they live out there alone. They get the same issues. They get the same issues. They want to be the best ascetic. They want somebody to write a, a, write a biography about their ascetic sacrifices out there not caring about anybody's praise. There is no escape. Housewife, mom, Lawyer, doctor, carpenter, we are wired to crave to be somebody. And uh, therefore, I returned to writing because I thought, might as well fight the battle here as anywhere else. Because I love it. I just got to get my loves purified. So when it comes to writing poems, why in the world do you do this? Why do you write these Advent poems? Why do you write poems for your family on birthdays and anniversaries and things? Why did you, why did you write a poem at the bridge collapse? What, what, what are you doing? Isn't this all just kind of get strokes? And all I know to say is I try to crucify it. I try. I just look it in the face. I acknowledge my, my, my pleasure at being complimented. Who doesn't, right? Who doesn't like to be liked? And then I just say, you're dead. You're not what's driving me. And God, kill me if it is. I say that. 
I said, Lord, if I'm doing this ministry at Bethlehem, whether it's preaching, poetry, visiting, Areopagus, if I'm doing this because my ego is the driving force, kill me. So if I drop dead one of these Sundays, then you know his, his ego was getting out of, out of whack. And the Lord was delivering you from a, a, a wacky, proud, arrogant, deceived pastor. So just, just know that the battle is there. And if you've ever wanted to write a poem or write an essay or write a novel or write anything, you're going to face it. Just face it. Just look it, look it right up there and kill it. And then write your novel, you know, write your poem or, or whatever. And labor to do it for the glory of Christ and the good of people. That's the story. Now, I've got a plan for where to go, but I don't know if it's, if it's Jason's plan. Uh, but I'm, I'm afraid I'll just talk too much if I, don't, if I don't stop. Here's where we're going. What is poetry and why read it? That's one. And then the rest of it is... Uh, why I write it and how do I write it? That's my outline. And um, anywhere along the way, please uh, raise your hand or shout at me if, if I'm not looking because this would be probably more interesting if, if I respond to some, some of your questions rather than just, just uh, saying what I thought you were going to ask. But th this is what I thought you would ask me if I stood up here and say, I'm supposed to talk about poetry. I thought you'd say, what is it? I thought you'd say, do you read it and why? I thought you'd say, uh, why do you write it? And I thought you'd say, how do you write it? That, so that's what I'll address. And along the way, you can, you can jump in anywhere. So I just thought up this definition today. I didn't write it down from anybody. I don't think anybody knows what poetry is. But I think we should try to say something. An effort to share um, a moving experience by using language that is chosen and structured differently from ordinary prose. I, th I think that's what it is. Uh, ordinary prose would be the way you talk all the time. And poetry is when you stop and think about the way you talk and you fiddle with it. You might do some meter, you might do some rhyme, you might put in lines, you might, you, and, then, and then the, the uh, chosen, I mean words are chosen that are not boring, not trite, they're different. They, they, they're image laden usually, they kind of mm, surprise, strike. So language, the, the content is chosen differently and the structure is different, and, and that's about all we can say because poetry is so diverse. I mean, my son's quite an accomplished poet, Karsten, and, and he doesn't write anything like I write. I mean, my, my write is just Rosa Red, Vows of Bue, or whatever, you know? That, that's, that's the way I sound when I'm around Karsten, it feels like to me, because he's just so amazingly gifted in, in non-traditional ways of doing it. Now, Different worldviews understand this word experience differently. So I've, I've, I think I've given a defini definition here that unbelievers can embrace and believers. However, once you start getting at the words here, the word experience, a moving experience differently. Objective reality lies behind the biblical worldview. Poetry will try to tell the truth and move people with renderings of experience that are good to be shared or good to be avoided. In other words, a Christian poet is burdened by truth. He's burdened by reality. He cannot do what um, Wallace Stevens, a um, 20th century poet, he said, after one has abandoned a belief in God, poetry is that essence which takes its place as life's redemption. So thousands of people think about poetry that way. If you ask them what it means, they get mad at you because it creates meaning in you. It doesn't conform to objective reality and try to impart that to anything. It, 
it just is. Now, there's a worldview behind that. And I don't think it's a Christian one. And I get into arguments about that with, with some Christians. Um, it's not simple. I'm not making it simple here. It's not preaching. I preach with my poems. I'm a preacher, unashamed preacher when I write poems. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to do it that way. But if you tell me this poem is no effort to reflect reality, either bad, good, or whatever, then I'd say I'm probably not going to waste my time here. I'm just looking around for a person just to see if she's here. Uh, Here's a woman who draws my sermons each Sunday. And uh, she came to me. She's come to me often, show them to me and explaining them to me. This is very abstract. Totally abstract. Uh, I could not see my sermon unless she told me what was there. And she'll point to many of the parts of this abstract drawing and she'll say, I don't know what this is. I just received this. So finally, last Sunday, I said to her, I don't think that's a good idea. She said, you don't, you don't think I should draw your sermons? I said, no, 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 no. Perfectly fine with you turning my sermons into this art form. I sometimes turn sermons into poems. You can turn them into visual art if you want to. That's fine. Not a problem. However, if you are letting your brain go and just doodling and saying it corresponds somehow to the sermon and you don't know what's on the paper there, you don't have any idea what you just did, you're opening yourself up to some very ugly stuff. And I do believe that. And I see it, frankly, coming out. She told me she does this, and she says, funny how the I get really strange people attracted to me when I do this, really other religions and so on. I said, well, that's because the Bible has a worldview. Here's what you should do. You should listen carefully to my sermon, and when you get an insight, draw that insight. I don't care how abstract it is. Draw that insight. That insight. Make an effort to get that insight in another form. Try. Just try. I'm not saying we're very good at it, that it's even possible. I'm saying don't draw what you don't know what you're trying to draw. Just draw and say, I don't know what that means. You have to fill that in. I don't think that's a good idea. So I'm going to illustrate all that with um, this. This is the introduction to uh, The Innkeeper. It's a poem that I wrote way back at the beginning of the Advent poems. And this is the, it was published in a little booklet form, and this is what I wrote. And what, this, is the, this is the most uh, complete thing I've ever written on poetry. It's only two pages, so I thought I would, I would read it through. And then maybe you can throw out some questions about this part. Good poetry speaks truth, not that each line is a naked fact, but lines, when taken all together, tell what really is, in spite of what may seem to be. There's no doubt that now we see through a glass darkly. Finite, fallen as we are, we need much help to see the light. To us, there are dark places in the truth. But who can say in this brief vapor's breath of life what light might break upon the soul that looks unwaveringly and long enough at some dark spot with prayer and pondering and hope that it may turn into a portal for the sun. So quickly do we pass over the words, then Herod sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem from two years old and under. The poet lingers and looks and looks and looks at this dark spot until he weeps and rages and then perhaps sees. And then, all too imperfectly, he tries with words to make the needle prick of light more visible for others, to bore the point more wide, to press the doubting face against the tiny perforation in the wall of pain, he writes a poem. Like Jeremiah, staring at the ruins of Jerusalem, where dying mothers 
boiled their children for a meal. When all the beard is plucked and the clothes are rent and the voice is hoarse from screaming, then what? A poem. The Bible called it Lamentations. A long, long labor. First to see and then to say that even here, God's mercies are new every morning. That's where that text comes from. Lamentations 3. In the middle of the most horrible book in the Old Testament, his mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's where that favorite text comes. We, just, we hate the rest of the book. Hate it. But we like that verse. And it comes smack in the middle. Five chapters, chapter 3, middle. God's mercies are new every morning and his faithfulness is great. The first, the second, and the fourth. Oops, I left something out, didn't I? I'm sorry. Five chapters. Here we go. The first, the second, and the fourth divided into 22 stanzas, each beginning with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Three agonizing acrostics. Then chapter three, the most personally intense of all, is still more tightly structured. Again, 22 stanzas. But now, each stanza, stanza has exactly three lines. And all three lines in each stanza begin with the same letter. One stanza for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And finally, chapter five, not an acrostic, but again, 22 lines long. Why? He's writing about women boiling their children. Why? Why this form? Why do poets do these things to themselves? Surely, if there is any place for authentic, unencumbered spontaneity, it's here in the overflow of agony. Why bind the heart with such a severe discipline of poetic form? Why labor weeks to give such shape to suffering? It is a testimony written on the heart that reality has contours. Being is one way and not another. Reality is one way and not another. There are hard, unbending facts God said, I am who I am. Not what we feel him to be or wish him to be or make him to be. He simply is. We must write the verse of our lives within the constraints of unbending ultimate fact. Therefore, laboring to look and look and look at what is really there until we feel what we are meant to feel and then say what we have seen and felt in some exact poetic form is a testimony to the truth that we are not God. Christ is the great granite objective, objective fact. He is the anchor that keeps poetry from floating away on the waves of emotion into the never-never land of saying anything we please, any way we please. He is the lens which lets us see if the modern creative king really has any clothes on? That's, an, that's talking to those people who say, I don't, know what I, I don't know what I just wrote, whatever you think. Should we admire that or be like little children and say, excuse me, I don't think the king has any clothes on. In other words, a chicken can write that. Just give him enough letters and he'll dance on them. He is hard, immovable, unshapeable, intractable reality that banks the sea of emotion into a river that has to flow this way and not that, deep and not shallow. When he died for our sins, it became evident once and for all that our fallen spontaneity needs the fine, sharp, painful sieve of a severe Calvary-like discipline before going public in poetry or even prose. He is the difference between artsy gamesmanship and lasting glory. 
In this Christ-dominated vision of the world, the innkeeper is one imperfect effort to see and feel and speak the light of truth behind the darkness of one brutal moment in the history of the world, the slaughter of the babes of Bethlehem. One test of its success will be this. That is one test of the poet, poet's, poem's success will be this. Does the pinprick of light in the canvas of pain shed any, any light of hope on the path of your suffering? If so, I will be glad. The book of Lamentations is a, is a, is a, um, a worldview-shaping book for me. Just a little glimpse here. Um, I gave you the structure. It's a series of acrostics. Each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, beginning a different verse in three of the chapters, beginning every line of the three stand, three line stanzas in chapter three, and then determining the number of the lines. I mean, just think of that. When you when you read Lamentations, think of that. That he did it that way. One third of the Old Testament is poetry. One-third of the Old Testament's poetry. And interestingly, it has no rhyme and no meter because that's hard to bring across languages. The structure it has is transferable. Is that an accident? It's parallelism. It's here. Just look at it. Um, he has blocked my ways with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. That's what we call parallelism. Say it once, say it again. He is a bear lying in wait for me. Say it again, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. Say it again, he has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughingstock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day. He has filled me with bitterness he has sated me with wormwood. You hear the boom, 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 boom. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Now that's agony. And he sat at a piece of paper and said, I will make a different verse start with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And when he came to the apex of his emotion in chapter 3, he narrowed the banks of the river emotion down to an almost impossible form. 22 different stanzas, three each, same letter beginning every single line in each stanza in order to express the deepest emotion. Locking himself into the greatest discipline at the moment when you would express the Expect the greatest spontaneity. What? What's that? That's a worldview comment. That's a worldview comment. God is God. God has form. God has structure. God has limits. God has bounds. I am not free to be anything I want to be with my emotion or anything I want to be with my mind. I am locked down to reality. And I, I will symbolize it with... Form. So, so that's my answer to, to what is poetry. You want to ask a question there, make a comment about any of that? It's heavy. Go ahead, David. And that, I'm saying, the structure is a commentary on his worldview, does not mean that if you write it another way, you're non-Christian. Because the worldview also encompasses other things besides structure. Free verse is not a sin. <laughs> Blank verse is not a little less sinful. Um, because there are other things. When you look at a cloud, do you think structure? Probably not. When you look at the solar system, you do. Nature, interestingly, as the way God has set it up, mingles freedom and structure in ways that 
from our vantage point anyway, are um, blended. And some will see one and some will see the other. Some people see, you know, a camel in the clouds and not just chaos. So, yes, I am saying that that Jeremiah disciplined himself to do this with his emotion says something about his view of the world and his view of God. And uh, I just think it's rooted in who we are. I don't think you have to even be a Christian to feel like this ought to be done. And it has to do with the fact that God is a fact. He has contours. This is very non-postmodern, that God has contours. He is this and not that. And therefore, there will be a this and not that. There will be a black and white, a yes and no, a beautiful and ugly, a right and wrong, a good and bad in all of our lives. And it will come out in our art. We will not be fudging on this all the time because that's God. Just somebody who believes in God is, is burdened by reality and limits and structure. And there's a great liberty in it. The greater poems, novels, any form of art, the greater ones will come out of that worldview. Another comment? Yeah. Absolutely. Poems. I was listening to Alan Jacobs being interviewed today. He's prof professor of literature at Wheaton. I was listening to his his uh, Mars Hill interview about uh, the new the new film and the movie, uh, the Golden What Compass. Uh, Philip Pullman, anti-Christian to the core, says so out loud in interviews. He wants to bring down Lewis, bring down Tolkien, bring down the church. He hates Christianity. He's anti-God, and he was he was interviewing. And he said his main gripe about Pullman's trilogy is it's naive or that it is, he said, Manichaean in its simplisticness, meaning everything's just black and white. If you, if you believe in God, you're evil. If you don't believe in God, you're good. Straight through all three books. There are no bad unbelievers in God. If you don't believe in God, you're good. If you do believe in God, you're bad. That's the way he set up his universe. And he, his comment is, it's just naive. Nobody is all bad and all good. We're all ambiguous. So only a person who has a view of an ultimate right and wrong can make sense out of gray. Gray doesn't even mean gray. You won't recognize it as gray unless you know black and white. So... Yes, poets should be the people who are going at the ambiguities of life. But doing it, that doesn't just throw up their hands and say, I guess life is just one big chaotic, unknowable phenomenon. That's not a Christian response to ambiguity. It it's roots it down into ultimate reality. So thank you. That's a very good clarification, asking about ambiguity in the gray areas. Let me... Um, let me go to the next question. Save your question and bring it out in a minute. Why, why read it? I mean, writing is one thing. You, if, you don't, if you don't read poetry, you'll never write any. You don't write anything good, at least, if you're never reading poetry. Here, here's why I read poetry. And when I say read, just a couple things here. Just get this book. If you don't have a book on poetry, just try this one. A Sacrifice of Praise, an Anthology of Christian Poetry in English from Kidman to the mid-20th century. So there you go. Uh, most of this is, is, is well-chosen stuff. So... Uh, this sat on my bed table for years and years. It's not there right now. And um, this is given to me by Andy Boyer, bless his heart. Um, why do you do that, Piper? Why do you, why do you read? More often than prose, poetry expresses a glimpse of reality that takes us beyond the ordinary. Interesting that the word prosaic usually means ordinary. Prose, the ordinary, the way you talk when you're not thinking about how you talk. Observation, the ordinary observation of the surface of things into the meanings and affections that we otherwise miss. Poets help us see what is really there but most miss. 
and they help us feel the fullness of what life can be. So very simply, I'm, I'm greedy for deep feelings and seeing what's there that I miss. I want to see more. I don't want to walk through the world and not see and have somebody come along and 10 minutes later say, do you see this, 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 amazing. And I say, no. I didn't see the bird. I didn't see the tree. I didn't see the cloud. I didn't see the rose. I didn't see anything. I'm just wrapped up in my ego and worried about how I'm coming across. I just don't want to be sick. I want to be alive. I want to see. Most prose does not help you with that. Some does. But poetry is by its nature. A poet just looks at something, feels something a week, two, or 30 years later, as Wordsworth said, poetry is uh, something remembered in tranquility. He remembers it, and then he tries to say it so that he feels it and others can share the feeling. And uh, I just think the Bible's real big on feeling, real big. Good, Lord. Thank you. I think that's absolutely right. In the, in the best use of poetry, I, I was going to read you the pulley by George Herbert, but um, I'm looking at the clock and thinking, nope, don't do that. Um, just a, a word about um, why write it? The joy of seeing and feeling more of God and his creation. That's what Jason was talking about, and of sharing the sight and the feeling with others. Poetry is an act of love, first love of contemplation. That is, not love that you love contemplation, but contemplating something because you love seeing what's there, and then a love of benevolence, meaning sharing it with somebody else. So I, th I think poetry at its best is, is a way of loving God, seeing him in his work, for what it really is, and then loving people by writing it down in a way that will help them see it and feel it better. Um, so, uh, just, a, just a word about the Advent poems. This is the conclusion of tonight's poem. I, this took about two hours to write this part right here. The poem, those Advent poems cost me roughly between 15 and 20 hours each week. And I just blitz for two days and stay up as late as I need to. I was up till 4 a.m. last week just because I got to write a sermon as well. And I, I just told Noel last week, I said, I'm glad Advent only comes once a year because this is horrible and I love it. <laughs> Isn't that straight? Isn't that crazy? I just hate writing these poems and I love having written these poems. <laughs> um, I, know they're, I know they're just, they're just, they're, they're what my, my dad used to read to us. He, he used to read to us Edgar Allan Guest. Edgar Allan Guest writes poems like, it takes a heap of living to make a house a home. That's what I grew up on. So I'm just, a, I'm just an average guy. I'm, I'm writing poems for my family and my church. I'm not a big, classy, you know, cutting edge, avant-garde poet. My poems rhyme. I want you to see... The, the the river that I build, the banks that I build for myself in these Advent poems is really narrow. This is iambic tetrameter and rhyming couplets without any exception at all. I give these poems when I'm done to John Morgan, who's my eagle eye, and he sends them back to me. He'll get this one back to me tomorrow, and he'll show me a rhyme that I missed 
or a beat that's missing in one of the lines. Now, iambic tetrameter simply means da 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 I just don't read them that way. But all of this, so I'll just show you. If, if, in fact, if I make a mistake, you can hear it because the rhythm breaks. It, it's ruined if I blow it. And I blow it about six times tonight. I hate blowing it, but especially when they're filming this for, you know, six services, four services tomorrow. So Bethlehem with candle three, are you afraid or are you free? Do Christian killers in the news make you a slave or do you choose with Christ and with Christ that they will make you brave. What do you fear the most? The grave did Jesus die and rise for this or that? The certain hope of bliss beyond the bullets and the blood would bless this planet with a flood or fearless sacrifice. What gun can cut us off from Jesus? None nor tribulation or distress nor danger sword or nakedness. Though we were killed like sheep all day, the shepherd of our souls, Josue. And when he comes, it will be plain that none of us has died in vain. The body that we was pierced and torn, never forget, will be reborn. That is severe. That is very severe. They have to rhyme every couplet, and they have to have alternating four beats, or I won't take it. Why do, why do I do that? I mean, I will get on one line and it'll cost me three hours to figure it out. And then I'll have a good flow for about 10 lines and then I'll get stuck again. And I sit there thinking, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Just relax. I mean, nobody will even know. Um, I don't read it like I just read it. So what difference does it make? People don't even hear the rhymes the way they're written. They don't hear the rhythm. All, all, most of your lines don't end at the end. They go into the next one, which is why it doesn't sound like da 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 And I, I just have this really deep conviction that this discipline forces me to see and feel what I otherwise would not see and feel. I mean, you, you, you get stuck at a, at a place. I mean, I, you, you start writing this right here. I, I, all I knew is that I wanted to, to apply to Bethlehem the Colorado shootings and the Nicodemus poem. I wanted to connect the two. That's all I knew when I started this. How, how, how I don't know. And it just, as, as, you, as you choose a word, do Christian killers in the news, now I've got to come up with the word that rhymes with news. That shapes the meaning of the next line. I don't know what I'm going to write in the next line yet. And I have to limit myself within, I've got a rhymer, a little computerized rhymer. So I click on news and get 40 options to use. And then I just work and work and work to try to not make it sound stupid. Con you know, trite and silly. Because that's the danger with rhyme. Rhyming poetry is rejected today because it just feels so, you know, old-fashioned and it just sounds trite. So there's, there's how I do the... Uh, Want to ask a question about that? No, I don't. No, no, no. It's like my sermons. I, I, I limit my sermon preparation to Friday. I don't start preparing until Friday morning. Because if I started on Monday, I'd work on it every day because of excellence. And I wouldn't do anything else with my life. Therefore, I settle for C plus, B minus, B plus, in everything I do. It's because I put constraints on me. So I've got, I mean, I've got a deadline for these points. I'm announcing. They're coming, folks. <laughs> it's incredible. Very few poets would do that, I think. Say, I'm going to write a, you know, a 16-minute poem, and I'll have it for you for Sunday. I don't have a clue what I'm going to say yet, but it'll come, and I'll read it in front of 4,000 people. 
That's, that's pretty risky. And I settle. I, I'm really unhappy with a lot of these lines. They sound kind of hokey. But I, I can read them well enough so you don't spot that. Um, I, I think my reading is what saves these. You'd never read these poems. That's why they, none, none of the, only a few of these are published. Because if you try to read these from scratch, you'd make it sound awful. Because it really isn't that good. <laughs> it's just a neat story, right? Um, and so, no, I don't put excellent on this. I put, you know, this poem, if I were grading this, you know, depends on the class, you know, what level we're working with here. But, you know, C plus, good effort, you know, interesting story. It, it's not an excellent, it's not a, it's, I think I accomplished my purpose. I can tell partly when I'm reading by the quietness of the people, by whether I'm, I'm connecting. But over here and then here. Yeah, Ruthie. That's what I want to happen. I'm moved. When I read them, I mean, my, my emotion is not artificial. Because father-son things, they run all through my poetry, right? I'm a dad with four sons. When I do a father-son thing and you've got a dying son in your lap, this is emotional for me. I won't be as emotional tomorrow morning because I've read it once. And you get the real deal on Saturday night. And they get the, you know, burnt over <laughs> in, in, in Sunday morning. Uh, but yes, I feel deep emotion when I'm writing about fathers and sons. And what were you gonna say? Um, um, what? What do you ever take the time to write an excellent poem? Um, I'll just answer that on a scale from slapping it down quick, and I can read you one of those, um, to working real hard. Uh, I very seldom go, just because I'm a preacher and a pastor and I don't have time, towards the excellent end. I, I would like to sometime. Here's one. Uh, oh, don't have the overhead for it. Written on Finding Noel's cell phone, left at home too many times. <laughs> She's in the back, so. I'm just a little phone beside the toaster here. Don't leave me all alone. It's hot and seems severe. Please take me in your purse or any way you can then I won't feel the curse, and you can call your man. <laughs> uh, more, more serious. Yeah, go ahead, Jan. Why? Okay. Well, I'll read it again because maybe I, I went over it too fast. I write for the joy of seeing and feeling more of God and his creation and of sharing the sight and the feeling with others. In other words, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't thinking from that angle. Why don't I paint? I can't paint. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I colored with Talitha last night, and I tried to stay inside the lines. I really believe in lines, and so I, I like to color inside the lines. Um, so, okay, so, so you're trying to get me to say there's something in me, and this is true. I mean, I don't mind being pre I. I said to Sam the other day, um, everybody should try to find in their life what they cannot not do and then dedicate it to Jesus. I cannot not write. Publish or not, I'll, in my, I'll be in my journal. Why? I don't know. Wired that way. I, I, it began in the 11th grade with Mrs. Canton. Don't know what she did or what she said, but something exploded in the 11th grade with essays and poetry with that English teacher. I declared an English major at Wheaton just because of that. I, can, I read painfully slowly, so I skipped all the novels classes and took only poetry. Novels are long. 
had to read about six novels. I looked at it and said, impossible. I can't read six novels in a semester. So I skipped all the novels classes. Still to this day, hardly ever read a novel. But poetry is short, and I'm an analytical person. So I can analyze, and I can write and think, and I can manage that. And why? Um, it's there. It's in my dad, two of my sons. Karsten does it for a living. Abraham does it when his baby dies. It just comes out. Benjamin does it with his hands. Get him to build a kitchen for you, and you'll see poetry. Uh, yeah. Jesse. I'm sorry, louder. That's not the case with, well, no, I'll take that back. The question is, have you been impacted by any secular poets that have helped you see things about God? I got on a Ted Kuzer binge two years ago. Ted Kuzer was the poet laureate for America for two years until he was just replaced with the present one. So I got three of his books, and I read them all. They're little short 100-page books. I got about you know, 80 poems in each one, and, and I found him. I mean, the reason I read them is not because of, I just was riveted by this man's sight of reality. Now, he's not a believer. He says so. And he comes, he's got one poem, I wish I'd brought it, in which he comes right up to the edge of faith. It stops. And uh, so the answer is yes. You, unbelievers, because of common grace, see things in the world believers don't see. Okay? So I'll say that then they'll, they won't put it in a, a biblical context, and so they'll generally misinterpret the big picture, but you can take that raw material of what they've seen, a bird in flight, and they say it in a way, and you say, I've never seen the way the wing on a, uh, not a hawk, what's that other one, osprey, is cocked like this in the middle. Why do they sit on light posts? You even notice they sit on light posts. You drive down the... Freeway, the light posts that come up like this. If you see a bird sitting on a light post, it just might be a hawk or an ostrich. There's something about that that makes them want to sit up there. Um, you think what to do here? What? Okay. Thank you. Um, another hand. Go ahead. Yep. David. Okay, the first one, um, we have a saying at Bethlehem that our goal in all we do here is undistracting excellence. That means don't do it so well people are attracted to the finesse and don't do it so poorly they're distracted by the bad grammar. In real life, you cannot live at an A-plus level. You will go insane and you'll do very little. Cooking has to be B plus. Baby care has to be B plus. Uh, everything has to be C to be quality because there are so many things in life that we're called to do. However, some are called to strive towards a remarkable excellence, and they, we should read them and benefit from them. When you ask them, now, what standard do you set for yourself? I would say undistracting excellence. I don't want to make a fool out of myself or the gospel or the pulpit by reading a stupid poem that people would say, I wish he wouldn't embarrass us so much. That, that would, I would fail if most of our people were saying, he's really got to stop writing those poems because he's so embarrassing. If that's the message I got just one season, I'd be done. And, and that'll come someday probably. I hope I spot it before it, it comes. So I have a standard and I'm pushing. I mean, I could write these a lot quicker if I ignored the meter and in the rhyme and didn't care if they sounded like da-da-da-da-da-da. So I have a standard of excellence, but my, oh, my, there's so many of these lines that could be better. 
It could be better. I could think of more creative words and more creative language. So different people are called to different things. Let's, let's all, when we're doing public ministry for the Lord, strive towards undistracting excellence. But some of you should strive towards remarkable, remarkable excellence, something extraordinary, a paradise lost. Blank verse for 300 pages. That's incredible. And he was blind. And the poem on his blindness is one of the most moving things I've ever read. When this darkness with my life half spent, and it ends with that famous line, they also serve who only stand and wait. I don't know if I even copied that out, but John Milton was blind through half the... John Milton. Um, Second half of your question, inspiration and um, perspiration. The analogy, I'm sure it's not original with me, everybody wants the burst of spontaneous inspiration that's beautiful. So what do you do? Sit and wait for it? No, but a farmer who wants the burst of spontaneous corn and cabbage and beans plows his field. And if it doesn't water, he'll build a watering system. And he'll plant his seed and he'll pull the weeds And God gives the growth. So there's an analogy. And the analogy is, uh, I'm sitting at this desk. Talitha came home from school the other day. She said, what have you been doing all day, Daddy? I said, staring at my computer. Because that's what it feels like most of the time. Lines come, I mean, it takes five seconds to write a line. (laughs) And the rest of the time you're staring. Thinking, hoping, and now here's where the inspiration piece comes. Being a Christian, I pray. I pray all the time. I get stuck. I say, God, I'm stuck. I I, I don't think this is going to be scripture when you help me. I won't make that mistake. So help me, please, anyway. This won't be scripture, but I can take some help here. And and, lo and behold, I wake up in in half an hour and five lounges later, and it happened. And sometimes, like I said, a line can cost me three hours. Sometimes ten come just like that. Just like that. And you wonder, whoa. There was, there was one line in here where I said, um, and, and he, it's Friday morning, and they were waiting for the trial to run its certain course. And that word run came at the end of the line. I needed a word around the run. Bang! It was just, the next line was there. It took no effort at all. Why? I, I don't know. Creativity is a, a mysterious thing. That something comes into your mind that wasn't there before and that you are writing lines that have never been written before on the history, in the history of the world, on the face of the planet. This is amazing that things are coming into being now that didn't exist before. Any poetry I'd recommend is especially good. George Herbert um, is one I lean on. John Milton, Shakespeare. <laughs> I mean, I mean the, the classic, the classic. Just get an anthology of 17th, 18th, 19th century. Get the Oxford verse of verse. Oxford doesn't print bad verse. Um, and if it's religious, it's almost all Christian for the last 500 years. So if you want to go there. But don't, you don't have to limit yourself to that, Joey. Beauty is objective. And God is not in a box. Um, to, to believe that God is the way he says he is, is not to put him in a box. We need to 
enlarge our minds. He, he is mind-boggling. It's not in vain that the Bible says how inscrutable are his ways and how unsearchable are his judgments, only it says that after three chapters of the most rigorous analysis of the providence of God. In other words, um, it's like, like C.S. Lewis said, the person who caves into temptation hasn't known the fullness of temptation. It's the person who doesn't submit to the temptation that knows the full force of the temptation. Um, so it is with the knowledge of God. If you quit studying God and then just say, he's bigger than you could ever imagine, you'll just talk gibberish the rest of your life about mystery. But if you labor like John Calvin or Jonathan Edwards to see more and see more and see more and know more and know more, you're going to be like the guy who in eternity climbs up over the first mountain range after 10,000 years of discovery and says, I made it. And he sees another mountain range stretching out. That takes another 10,000 years of climbing into the knowledge of God. And he pulls himself up to the edge 20,000 years into eternity and he sees another mountain range. And so it goes forever. But the person who stays behind says, that's a big range. <laughs> well, what, what, what kind of praise is that? What, so I don't buy the God in the box thing. I say go and push on in and say what you see and you will write more profound things than those who just stand back here and talk generally about mystery. Because Here's another way to say it. God is not honored by being worshipped for what we don't know about him. God is not honored for being worshipped for what we don't know about him. In other words, the people who just say mystery, 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 you get over that in a big hurry. That's a short praise song. But if you read your Bible and you go deep, you'll say a thousand things about him that are true and glorious, and there'll be 10,000 more just over the next horizon. Um, beauty in the eye of the beholder. Um, well, yes, different people regard different things as beautiful. That does not mean there's no such thing as beautiful. Jesus Christ is glorious, whether you see him that way or not. He's beautiful. His ways are beautiful. His cross was beautiful. His resurrection is beautiful. His character is beautiful. And some don't see it that way, and that doesn't make it not that way. C.S. Lewis talks about the insane man banging his head against the wall in an insane asylum saying, there is no sun, there is no sun, there is no sun. It doesn't have the slightest effect on whether the sun's shining outside. And so our subjective responses to reality do not determine reality. We should strive towards some measure of objectivity, recognizing there's a lot of subjectivity out there. Yep. I would say the main discipline that is in my life that helps my creativity is meditation on the scripture. In other words, one of the reasons I get behind in my Bible reading is that I read very slowly. Um, I was reading Jonah after Obadiah this morning. Let me see if I can find Jonah. Uh, Isaiah, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Or Micah in there. Nope, there he is. Jonah. He's in the belly of the fish, and he's, he's writing poetry. <laughs> I mean, the poetry is here in the belly of the fish. He wrote it later. Um, and then I came to this line. If I can find it. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake the hope of steadfast love. My, my reading was over. It was over. That's all I did for the rest of my 15 minutes or so is try to figure that out. Just, I'm looking at it. So I got my Hebrew out. I was like, okay, gotta, you know, it's hard to translate poetry. So I got my Hebrew out. And literally it's uh, those who keep or watch or regard vain idols abandon or forsake 
their hesed, their love, God's love, not their own. It's abandoned God's love for them. That's worthy. That is worthy of a poem. If you embrace a vain idol, you forsake being loved. This is not rocket science. They can't love you back. They're just wood. So the point there is, I read real slow because I think a lot about what I read. I ask questions. I ask hard questions. I ask practical questions. I'm just a little thing here about application and interpretation. You know, hermeneutical scholars will get you to distinguish those. Uh, here's interpretation. Find out what it really says. Then application to your life. Guess what? Applicatory questions are more illumining of meaning than most questions because they force you not to play games with the text. What am I going to do with this this afternoon forces me to interpret it more faithfully, more zealously, more deeply than if I just said, uh, what's the historical background for such and such a word? Now, that, they're not either or. I'm just pointing out practical, applicatory questions of meaning force meaning issues, not just application issues. So that's one discipline. Another discipline is writing. I write all the time. I'm writing all day, every day, writing star articles, writing sermons, writing blogs, writing articles, writing in my journal, trying to process my experience. So just write. If you want to be a writer, you got to write. So I forget what famous poet or author said, so a young person came in and said, I want to be a writer. First thing he says, what have you written in the last week? Nothing. Well, forget that. You won't ever be a writer. You, if you're going to be a writer, you write. And to be a writer, you just write better later. But if you're not writing, you're not going to be a writer. So don't dream about being a writer if you're not writing. What are you doing? That's what you cannot not do. And then turn that for Jesus. Dedicate that to Jesus. Okay, I think our time is up. Let me just glance through what I have here. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, first, let's end where we began, namely with confession that I have to constantly cleanse the joy of the joy of, of uh, praise from man. I, it feels good to be praised. Um, I don't think it's wrong when you're praised to be glad that you're being praised. I don't think that's wrong. I don't think odd if you... Oh, I don't think that should be happening right now. You should not like what I just did. If you like what I just did, I'm failing. That, that's just ridiculous. So it cannot be wrong to hear people echo in their mouths that they like what you did. The, the wrong is the overweening craving of what it does for your ego and that if it vanished, you would feel that the reason for writing vanished. That they're only disapproving because if that were the case you would be a slave to your audience instead of to the truth. So that's the confession and that must be resisted. Discovery is pleasurable to me. Discovering things about a reality that I didn't know before. Discovery is pleasurable. I could 
analyze why, but I'll just leave it. Saying things in a fresh way is pleasurable to me. Finding a new and effective way to say something feels delightful. Creating feels right. Dorothy Sayers wrote a book called The Mind of the Maker. Everybody should read that if you're into art at all. The Mind of the Maker, in which she simply tries to draw out how the human soul in its tripartite form is like the Trinity. And to be a maker is what we are in the image of God. To be a maker. You make things. You might make a carpenter. You might make a meal. You might make a song. You might, you might, whatever. I'm a snowman. We are makers. And so to make is really pleasurable. Or um, I feel God's pleasure when I run, Eric Little says. So some people are just runners. They're just wired to run. And they feel that they are coming into their own as they run. Um, and then thirdly, I get tremendous pleasure when somebody is helped to see God better. Really, I think that's what I exist for. Whether it's a sermon or a poem or anything, if somebody experiences God, knows God, loves God more because I exist or did what I did, that really feels good. And I think that's really pure joy. That's the joy of love, that somebody is delighting in God because you're delighting God or what you've done. So those are three things that come to mind, and we're, we're way over time. And uh, I'll, I'll save for another time all these uh, examples of poems that I've, I've done. But okay. <laughs> we'll have to pick it up there. Let me, let me pray, and you've been very, very patient, very kind. Father, we know that people are lost and perishing, and we know that people are suffering around the world, and we want to bring all of our lives into the service of relieving human suffering, especially eternal suffering, and replacing it with the deepest possible joys that last forever. Poetry is just one of the little ways in which we can help each other see and savor Jesus Christ and the world that he made and the complexity of redemptive history and the complexity of the human soul and the mixture of good and bad that is in the world. So help us to serve each other well and to serve the world well with the gifts you give us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.